Thank you, Mark, for this uh, introduction. Uh, the way you presented it gives the impression that I'm an important person, but I am not. The, what I am the most proud of is to be a, a simple soldier in the ICD, and I'm very uh, pleased to be able to share my modest experience with the distinguished members and the audience in this forum. I'm going to speak about a subject which is very wide and very deep, and it cannot be dealt with in 15 or 20 minutes. I think this is the period you gave me. I'm going to even shorten it to make shorter so that uh, uh, we can give more opportunity to the question and answer, because the question of an questions and answers uh, chapter of uh, such meetings is, is more interesting and uh, and the audience is more focused uh, uh, so that uh, they may take home uh, more of what I'm going to say. When I said the, that when I choose the, uh, the subject of various aspects of the Syrian crisis, actually Syrian crisis has become a very complicated and intricate subject. And each chapter has different dynamics, different players, different game makers, and different interests. Uh, of course, you all know that the, the main parties of the Syrian crisis was a demonstration that took place in the year 2011 uh, in the south of uh, Syria, and the uh, regime, uh, Syrian regime used disproportionate forced to repress these demonstrations, and it uh, grew out of control, and then uh, uh, the Arab Spring spread also to Syria. Uh, the, when we s try to see what are the parties in this demonstrations, or in this rebellion, or whatever you call it in, in this crisis, one, on the one side, it is the Bashar Assad regime, and with his clan of the uh, Alawite, uh, mainly Alawite uh, Syrians, perhaps Christians, because of their uh, psychology of minority, may join the Alawites, mm -hmm. and then the remainder. But the remainder was fractured into so many small groups that it was very difficult to cope with it. Now there are at least uh, 20 to 30 different big groups, and uh, perhaps more than 1,000 combat units that do not take order from one, one headquarters, but act on their own initiative. So when there are that many players, it is, of course, difficult to control them. Who are the foreign actors? Almost the entire international community uh, is involved in it, but at least 32 countries are part of a coalition which is led by the United States. This coalition is trying to, uh, first of all, identify moderate moderate opposition groups and support them in their endeavor to overthrow the regime. This is how one can uh, summarize the situation. And the US, of course, is leading this coalition. But later on, on a subject that I'm going to touch upon uh, a little later, that's to say the dawning of uh, a Russian plane by Russia, Russia stepped in, in a very strong manner, and now uh, the number of major players grew uh, in, uh, in Syria. The foreign actors uh, are the United States, and the, in the coalition, which is led by the United States, uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar are more in favor of uh, if you uh, if you divide or if you put in order the uh, fractions according to whether they are moderate 
or less moderate or fundamentalist Salafis, etc. Uh, Turkey, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar are supporting the less moderate ones. The remaining of the international community is supporting more moderate ones. And uh, Russia and Iran is supporting the regime. And uh, the supporters of the regime is also joined by Hezbollah, uh, that is mainly active in Lebanon. When the situation was so complicated with the participation of that many players, then came the question of the emergence of the ISIS or IS, whatever, I mean, there are, you may call it in different way, Islamic State or Islamic State in Iraq and Syria or Islamic State in Iraq and the Levan or in the uh, Arabic uh, uh, abbreviation, which is called Daesh. Daesh uh, is the uh, abbreviation of Islamic State of uh, Iraq and, and the Levan. With the emergence of the Daesh, the priorities in the Syrian crisis has changed. Before that, mainly it was the opposition, moderate opposition, less moderate, or an even lesser moderate opposition supported by the international community. Now the fight has shifted towards fighting the uh, Daesh because Daesh was posing a bigger threat both to the, to the other uh, fractions in Syria and also to the international community back in their home. A, a Russian plane was downed in Sharm el-Sheikh and they carried out uh, atrocious acts of terror in France and in many other places. So uh, the, the question of fighting with Daesh has uh, got the priority. So when the situation was made more complicated in Syria, as, it, as if it was not uh, enough, a more complicated factor uh, happened. It was the shutting down uh, of a Russian plane uh, by Turkey because this plane has violated the Turkish airspace for, for how long? For 17 seconds. Was it necessary to down it? Is it the right of a country to down a, a foreign plane that violates your own uh, airspace? You may do so, but you may do also uh, something else, not to uh, shut it down, to escort it with other planes and to lead him outside Turkey, because it's only 17 seconds. And the, the indications were that uh, it was not threaten, threatening the national security of Turkey, it was violating the, uh, the Russian plane was violating the airspace, so there's no doubt there. And uh, when your uh, airspace is violated, you have the right to take appropriate measures, but these appropriate measures may change according to circumstances. Uh, Turkey should have thought considered the consequences of it. Uh, as the previous speaker from Russia was mentioning, she did not enter into politics, but I can enter because I'm, I served as a politician for eight years and also served as foreign minister of Turkey and the, foreign minister, the first foreign minister of the ruling party in Turkey. So I can say it uh, more easily that if I were the decision maker at the moment of this uh, violation of the airspace, I wouldn't have instructed the Turkish army to down it. I would tell them that please escort this plane outside Turkey 
even for 17 minutes, it, it wouldn't have taken place. So now we are suffering the negative consequence of it. Because Turkey and uh, Russia has developed a, a friendship, business-like friendship, not cordial relations perhaps, but business-like relations since 1920s or 21. So almost uh, 95 years. And uh, this friendship was built up brick by brick. So destroy it with such a sudden decision was not worthwhile. I don't want to dwell uh, more on the Turkish-Russian relations aspect of it, but I will come to the, uh, to the subject of what conclusions uh, it entailed in the international relations in general. Since Turkey is a member country of NATO, as soon as the uh, aircraft was donned, Turkey invited NATO, NATO Council for an emergency meeting. Of course, NATO uh, demonstrated solidarity with Turkey. This is something that the allied countries should have done, and they have done the right thing. They may have criticized in, behind the closed door that Turkey did not need to go that far. But ultimately, they showed solidarity. They sent their troops to uh, their uh, aircraft, fight, fighter aircraft to Turkey. They sent their ships to the region. So now it has become a rivalry, a competition between Russia and NATO in the Eastern Mediterranean on the one hand and in Syria on the other hand. So now, uh, a crisis which was essentially a Syrian crisis has turned to become a crisis or a competition or rivalry between NATO and, uh, and, and Russia. The show of solidarity by NATO is very important. Actually, when I was working in NATO, we usually said that the, the, the most important strength of NATO is that its strength is not tested. When it is tested, we do not know what's going to happen. But its strength is not that it was not tested. And I hope that it will not be tested and that the, the, the two sides will understand, the, the wisdom will prevail and perhaps there will be a new balance of power in the Middle East, starting with a balance of power within Syria. One important factor in the Syrian crisis is Kurdish factor. As you may know, Kurds are the number of Kurds in the world is uh, estimated to be between 35 million and 42 million, scattered in four different countries. The biggest part is in Turkey, then in Iraq, then in Iran perhaps, then in Syria. And the Kurds are the only people in the world, the biggest people in the world that has no a state, that do not have a state of their own. Something that looks like a state has, been, has already been established in the north of Iraq during the Saddam period. United States declared air exclusion zone uh, north of the uh, parallel uh, 36. And using this opportunity, uh, the Kurds living in the north of uh, Iraq developed their own administration. They had already on the paper uh, a status which allowed them to be autonomous in their affairs, <coughs> dating back to 
1979. So they developed it. Now, uh, northern Iraqi Kurds have their parliament, their government, their uh, foreign minister, but it's not called foreign minister, secretary for foreign affairs, etc. So they have everything except the name of an independent state. So in the other countries, this Kurdish identity is recognized at various levels. In, uh, Ira in Iran, there are two provinces which is called Kurdistan. In Turkey, there is no province which is, their province or their region is not delineated. And the biggest Kurdish town in Turkey is Istanbul. It is not Diyarbakir where they are majority. And the second biggest Kurdish city or Kurdish population is not again back in Diyarbakir, but it is in Izmir or in Mersin in Turkey. So they are scattered. So, uh, and there are more mixed intermarriages in Turkey than in many other, uh, in the other four countries. So uh, in Turkey, it is, they are not as close to the recognition of the, the, their identity as it is in other countries. In Syria, not only their identity was not recognized, the Kurds were not recognized as a citizen. They did not have identity. They were not registered as citizen. They were regarded as non-existent. They could not sell their, they could not own a real estate, they could not sell uh, a real estate that they inherited from their uh, parents, and they could not travel abroad because they cannot receive passport. It's only part of them gained this in 1970s, and uh, later on, after the Syrian crisis broke out, Bashar Assad, to make a gesture and to gain their support, also recognized their citizenship. So uh, the recognition of the identity of Kurds is at different levels in different countries where Kurds live at present. Now, of course, with the problem of fighting the Daesh, you need uh, foot soldiers, the, the soldiers that have their boots on the ground, none of the outside actors want to send their troops, their ground troops to Syria to fight Daesh. The only or the most appropriate people or fighters that could do the job are the Kurds. Because they are defending, first of all, their own land, if you send their Guatemalan soldiers, they wouldn't know what they are fighting for, whereas Kurds will be fighting for their own uh, land, so they, they, they can fight better. And the international community needs, at present, the Kurds. And the Kurds most probably will benefit from this and promote their cause of the recognition of their identity. And from that, I will come to the last part of my presentation. What are the future prospects in Syria? There is an initiative started by Russia in Vienna, which provides that uh, at the beginning of the next year, there will be a ceasefire, which will be followed by an initiative of bringing together uh, moderate uh, opposition together with the government regime, try to write a, a constitution and the election law and carry out elections uh, with the observation of the international community. And uh, whoever emerges as winners as it was done in, in Tunisia, for instance, 
should, rule, should continue to rule uh, Syria. This is the project, but now that the, the sides on the, the parties in the Syrian crisis have become sharper uh, and represented by NATO on one side and uh, Russia on the other side, I do not know whether this will be, this could be sustained. Because before that, there was no NATO-Russian competition. So Russia and the Western countries could come to an agreement in, to conduct this uh, process of democratization in Syria. After the downing of the Russian plane, I do not know whether it will be possible when the Russia on one side and the NATO on the other side are competing for power in, in Syria. Uh, whatever happens, of course, uh, either with the uh, elections or without the elections, there are risks that Syria's uh, territorial integrity may not be preserved. This is a potent po possibility. The earlier a solution is found, the better, because the more the war staggers, then people will withdraw to the regions where they are more homogeneous. And then it is, of course, a recipe for the dismemberment of the country. How it is going to happen? Most probably, there is the coastal belt in Syria which starts in Ladikia in the north and goes to Tartus, and which includes also Aleppo and perhaps Damascus. And the international community used, uh, minted a, a, an interesting word for it, the useful Syria. This may be this, the future Syria of Alawite people. And the Kurds, may have their autonomy and perhaps if it is dismembered, of course, they may have also their state in the north. At present, they are in the forms of cantons in Haseke in the east, northeast, and Kobane. And there is a, a belt of 98 kilometers where Turkey proposes to establish a security zone or no-fly zone, and uh, to clean this place from the Daesh and uh, accommodate there, settle there, uh, the uh, moderate opposition factions, Kurds and Turkmens. If th this has become, of course, more difficult now that the Russia and Turkey is competing there, if Turkish proposal is not accepted, then the Kurds may link the two cantons in the north, that's Haseke and Kobane, to another canton in Afrin. And from there, they may seek an accommodation to reach the Mediterranean. If this happens, then there will be a Kurdish belt all the way from Iran, north of Iraq, north of Syria, down to Mediterranean. Is this possible? Under the present circumstances, it is a good dream, but distant dream. But they will try their best in order to achieve this, now that international community needs the Kurds. So uh, these are the prospects uh, in Syria. And the remainder of the Syria, maybe either Daesh Syria or Salafi Syria, mainly uh, ruled by the Sunni uh, part of, the, of Syria. Sunnis represent up to 78 to 80% of the country. And the uh, uh, remaining 20% uh, is divided as 8% Alawites, 12 or 13% or 14% Christians. So the Sunnis are the biggest majority, but we, should, we cannot presume that all Sunnis will 
be opposed to the present regime. Because the present regime, Bashar Assad regime and Fadr Assad regime, recruited brilliant people and big businessmen from the uh, Sunni segment of the society and uh, gave them positions of the, of the visibility. So we cannot presume that it will be a sharp divide where you can say, on this side there are only Alawites and on this side there are only uh, Sunnis. This will not happen. So these are the prospects of the uh, future of Syria. Now, I left a lot of questions unanswered because I thought that when you ask the questions, and I encourage you to ask provocative questions, because the more the questions are provocative, the more what I, uh, what I will say in my answer will remain in your mind. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yakesh. And let's go immediately to the questions. Now, does one of my colleagues have a wireless microphone somewhere? Ideally. And then I guess we can start maybe in the front on this side for a change and then work our way back. And then, Mr. Yakesh, what do you suggest? Maybe taking three or four questions together which and then a response? Whichever way you decide. Because, again, the goal is to allow as many to speak as possible. So let's, let's try. OK, we'll start in the front. And please introduce yourself as well. Thank you. Uh, Ahmad Al Maliki, I'm an Egyptian peace activist, political analyst, slash journalist, so it's a lot of things. So I have a question that's bothering me if you want a provocative question. 17 minutes, right? Seconds. 17, 17 seconds. seconds. So. Thania. Okay, so I will go with 17 seconds. When the warning to the Russian pilots during the 17 seconds, because your radar got, got, got it spotted the Russian plane invading the Turkish airspace, reported to the high command, and then gave the warning, and then shot the plane, all of this in 17 seconds? Thank That's you. the question. You're welcome. Okay. Hello. Raphael Dapar, um, United Kingdom, Ministry of Defense. Um, so you've asked for provocative questions and I intend to ask one. There are those who claim that Turkey down, down the Russian plane on the behalf of NATO and the United States. And I wanted to ask what your views on such claims are. Also, how can cultural diplomacy facilitate relations between the two nations after this atrocity? Thank you. Maybe one more? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Said Nermatullah Sahir, Deputy Chief of Staff for the Office of the President of Afghanistan. Uh, it's me here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, I have three questions uh, regarding the speech uh, that uh, Mr. Minister has presented. One, what was the role of international coalition and the creation of ISIS as it's a claim at the moment? The second, if now the priority is to fight ISIS, how will the line be, be drawn between ISIS and those opposing the Assad regime? And the third question is goes to the Russian proposal of uh, having election next year or uh, uh, making constitution and then election a law and afterward doing election. How possible it is in the presence of Assad regime, the legitimacy of the election as well as how transparent it will be? Thank you. Thank you very much. Brilliant questions. Uh, the answer to uh, the question of... We'll go again. We'll go again. We'll go again. First a response and then we'll take another group. So yeah. One, one there will be another round. Another. Uh, Actually, there are uh, details on this question that you asked. Uh, Turkey claims that the Russian plane was born ten minutes before, five minutes beforehand, ten times. In this five minutes before it entered for 17 seconds, not minutes, 17 seconds. Uh, it did five minutes when it was approaching the border, 
uh, Turkish uh, aircraft, Air Force, warned that it, you are coming towards the Turkish territory. Please change your, your direction towards the south. This was the Turkish side claimed that this was communicated 10 times in the last five minutes to the Russian side, and there was no answer. And the, the, the Russian uh, plane was hit, actually, when it has already left the Turkish uh, air space. Because even if you uh, aim at something, the time it takes, it will be more than 17 seconds. So it has, and it, it, was, it fell down in the Syrian territory. Turkey says that it was hit while it was still in the Turkish territory, the airspace. So uh, there are uh, details there which uh, confirm that yes, the violation took place, but if we uh, focus our attention on whether the airspace was violated or not, we may lose the, the, the main subject, which is whether it was wor worthwhile to, or whether it was justified to down a plane for, uh, for such a violation. And uh, uh, the question by, the, uh, by our uh, distinguished friend from UK, uh, was it done because of, for, for the sake of serving on behalf of NATO? Well, you cannot say that uh, the, the commander who uh, fired at the Russian aircraft took the authority from uh, Sakur in Europe, in, in Brussels. It did not. But it took the instructions from the Turkish authorities, and the prime minister of Turkey said that it, is my, it was my instruction. The rules of engagement was very clear, and we invited Russians when they violated Turkish air, the airspace on more than one occasion in the past. And this was also uh, this question was also raised when. Uh, President Putin came to Turkey for the G20 meeting in Antalya, and Putin apologized for these violations. At that time, no aircraft was downed. And so it was agreed that uh, Russia wouldn't do it again. And the, uh, the Turkish part claims that when they did not receive any answer from the Russian plane, so they decided that it, should, it may not be a Russian plane, so we downed it. And there were even statements made, made by the politician, politician which says that if we knew that it was a Russian plane, perhaps we should have behaved in a dif different way. Is there an intricacy that we do not understand? Yes. Well, I served 40 years in diplomacy. I served in NATO. I followed courses in the NATO Defense uh, College. So I still, there are a lot of things that I do not, I, I'm not able to uh, explain to myself. NATO benefited from it at one stage, at least to the extent that there were rumors that Turkey was drifting away from the Euro-Atlantic community and turning to the east. At one stage, President Erdogan proposed Putin in a meeting in Moscow that if Turkey is admitted to the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Group, perhaps it wouldn't wait in the, at the door of the European Union. So was it a joke? We do not know, but I mean, Turkey gave the impression that uh, it, it has back in his mind uh, the possibility of turning its back to, to, to the West. Now that w with this event, NATO showed a, a very strong solidarity with Turkey. Turkey, 
Turkey's Turkey and NATO rediscovered each other. And since almost all NATO members are also at the same time the members of the European Union, Turkey's relations with the European Union has also uh, turned a little bit in, the, in another direction to reinventing again each other. An agreement was signed uh, for the uh, for the op opening of the negotiating chapters, which was blocked since years. And uh, Turkey is, uh, is going to be given something like 3 billion uh, euros to accommodate the rejected uh, Syrian or other refugees. So this solves part of the refugee problem of the European Union countries. It also alleviates, to a certain extent, Turkey's problem. So uh, Turkey and the European Union also is, I mean, the relations are towing, not warming up. Warming up is a little perhaps for future, but it is towing at present. And uh, uh, the second part of your question was, what NATO can do, how, how what, NATO could do in order to to find to reconcile Turkey and Russia. Was it this part? It's, um, what cultural legacy do you see the relationship Not NATO, but diplomacy in general. Diplomacy. Actually, uh, since I I served 40 years in diplomacy, I believe that my profession is exactly for this type of things. When there is a strained relations, there are strained relations between two countries, diplomacy should step in. And after diplomacy, then, the work of ICD type of uh, work, that's say cultural diplomacy, should be part of the diplomatic solution. The previous speaker from Russia, is she here? She may not be here. She emphasized on the role of the, of the cultural dimension, soft power. And uh, diplomacy uh, is the only way to solve the, the question at present. Uh, Mr. Lavrov, uh, the Russian foreign minister, said immediately after the crisis of donning the uh, Russian plane that uh, he, he doesn't expect that this will escalate to m military uh, confrontation. And, uh, if you ask me whether there is a need for a military confrontation, I would say no. The world does not need it at present. And uh, Turkey and Russia need it less. Perhaps the solidarity shown by, uh, uh, by NATO together with Turkey, on the one hand, and the difficulties that Turkey is running into because of the retaliatory measures by Russia, will open up the eyes of both Turks and Russians, and perhaps they will force their leaders to come together and say, well, what, on, what on the earth we are doing, for, I mean, that type of things? C can, we, I mean, can we not benefit from it? Because the retali retali retaliation measures are harming both nations. And the question by the distinguished friend from Afghanistan, role of the international community for the creation of ISIS. I don't think that uh, uh, there was an effort to design it uh, a, 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 as a scourge for the Middle East. It was, uh, it was thought of and planned. Uh, as you may know, ISIS is the is the fruit or the conclusion of another development. When uh, the uh, um, Americans invaded Iraq, a group of soldiers from Ba'ath Party resigned, and they formed an organization called Tawhid uh, Jihad. Tevhid ve Jihad, I think this was the name. And this organization 
developed, changed names several times, and the circumstances in the Middle East uh, was favorable for its being, becoming stronger and stronger. And when Nuri al-Maliki, the previous uh, prime minister of Iraq, followed a heavily sectarian policy in order to revenge what the Sunnis have done in the past to the Shias. This time, he wanted to take revenge of it, and he repressed uh, Sunnis and favored the, uh, the Shia. And, and the Sunni community in Iraq became opponent of the regime, and this created the ground for ISIS to grow better. And ultimately, it broke out by occupying Mosul and then, then the other things. So it is not something pre-staged, thought of, planned, but the circumstances in the Middle East uh, created it. Uh, I, I am not in favor of the conspiracy, of living in conspiracy theories, so I explain the emergence and development, flourishing of uh, ISIS as a consequence of the circumstances that prevailed in the region. Line between the ISIS, the Daesh, and the moderate or Salafis, I don't think that you can draw a line there. Because there are, as I said, 1,200 different combat units. And they are at different uh, place in the spectrum of parties, from the most fundamentalist to the, to the most moderate. And wherever you draw the line, it is a subjective line. But one can say for sure that the ISIS is the extreme of extreme. It is ISIS has to be treated as one category, then the others which are the uh, remnants of the uh, Al-Qaeda, such as Jepet al-Nusra and the others. So uh, ISIS has to be taken a separate group, the others part of the, the other uh, spectrum. And uh, how uh, a, an election could be regarded as legitimate when Assad is there? Was this the question? Yeah. Actually, the international community, uh, there is a saying that the most beautiful girl can give whatever she has. The, mo the, most, the, the most sophisticated uh, election system could produce whatever the circumstances warrant in, in that country. So we cannot expect a Swiss type of democracy or election in Syria in the, sh in the uh, short future. We cannot expect like a British type of democracy elections, but a better election under the supervision of international observers, you may put them tens of thousands of international observers. Of course, these observers coming, uh, depending upon which country they are coming from, their approach to the toler tolerance of the uh, irregularities in the elections. Also, it will vary from one country, one observer to the other. But the international community could do it best. If you don't do it, then the chaos will continue. So it is the next best. I mean, after the, the worst case is the present situation, and the next best is uh, some sort of election where the election law will be prepared with the cooperation and participation of the uh, moderate uh, opposition. Of course, you cannot invite uh, Daesh because they will, I mean, their perception of democracy is entirely different. Uh, so the international community could do whatever it's possible to do. It cannot achieve miracles. So now uh, we go to the second round of three questions. I think you were the ones, yeah. Uh, if you like no, OK, you, you decide. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Mahmoud Esmati from Afghanistan, working with United Nations. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, raising our awareness about uh, security, uh, current security situation, and also uh, politics. Uh, but uh, my comment, it, it's not a question, it's just a comment, is uh, actually my expectation is uh, to uh, uh, get the concrete recommendations from the speakers. How we can uh, uh, use cultural uh, diplomacy in building bridges of peace and reconciliation. This is the main topic. Of course, we know what's going on in the Middle East or in between Turkey and uh, Russia and uh, what's going on between Afghanistan and Pakistan border. But uh, what we would like to uh, find, design, a kind of idea to create a platform for uh, a resolution with using cultural diplomacy. I give you an example in uh, Afghanistan. I just uh, 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 noticed that my countryman is here from uh, president office, I think. Uh, we have a tradition um, uh, called Jerga or Shora. It's a tradition, uh, traditional dispute resolution mechanism. Even we use these uh, traditions for solving problems between Pakistan and Afghanistan. So that kind of ideas help all of us. We are a family to uh, learn. We are committed. We believe to cultural diplomacy. We are not here to blame uh, each other. Thank you very much. Sir, my name is Iyar Mohamed Badini, editor of Balustan today from Pakistan. First of all, I would like to tell you for nice and wonderful presentation, sir, very nice speech to take all the angles. Uh, my question is that you also point out in their own speech, last 95 years you have a relation, good relation with the Russia. But unfortunately, when the Turkish hit the uh, war plane, they uh, in uh, Syrian side affect the relationship between uh, Turkey and Russia. Uh, what do you say, what do you think the Turkish economy not affect from this? Uh, millions of the tourists coming every year, especially uh, from the Russian side, the security they are provided, and other export and imports of the Russians, they are not affected. Second part of my question is that if uh, the uh, NATO, Russia, all these are against ISS and Daesh in the same page, why they conflict between them? Oh, this is the question, man, you know. And my request from Mr. Mark, Sir, we are travel from the thousands of kilometers come to here. We would like to un, uh, ask the question. We like to their answer. We will be listen. Last uh, round of the I, uh, question from all th three ladies and gentlemen. But unfortunately, they are not given our answers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I'll have to be the bad guy again and say we do need to conclude because we're now 40 minutes late. But I had to run upstairs, so I allowed for a few other questions. I would give you, of course, the chance to respond uh, the best way you can. Obviously, there are big questions. And uh, we do need to try our best to keep on the schedule as a courtesy to the other speakers and my colleagues who've arranged the program. So I wish that we could take all the questions, and I wish that we could respond to them all. I'm trying my best. Uh, but Mr. Yakesh, please, uh, we would invite you to offer perhaps some responses well, to yes, the questions one, that have been posed. One minute, perhaps, in this case. Uh, Russia, what, what, the, what are the economic effects uh, of, the, uh, of this crisis between Russia? It will affect negatively uh, both sides. It will affect more negatively Turkish side for two reasons, because uh, Russia is selecting the areas where it will hit uh, less its economy, and it will hit more Turkish economy, one thing. Secondly, Russian economy is two and a half times bigger than the Turkish economy. If we are talking of 
a loss of one billion uh, dollar, for instance, this one billion dollar uh, uh, occupies a bigger place in Turkey's economy than it occupies in the Russian economy. So uh, there is no doubt that uh, Turkey will suffer from it, and uh, perhaps this, if the problem is not solved, it will continue in other fields, and the Russia is determined to hit Turkey's interest in other areas as well. And the other question, why NATO and Russia, since they are both against ISIS, they cannot, they are still competing. Uh, of course, if you are in the international relations, not only uh, studying in schools, but in the practice, you would have noticed that these international kind of ideals, fighting uh, the uh, ISIS and preserving the uh, universal values, that is one thing. But every country at present wants to use the, the present crisis to find out how better a position I can obtain in the post-crisis Syria and or after defeating uh, Daesh. This is what the countries are after. If you were the prime minister of any of the foreign actors, you would have also thought that way because you have to bring something home saying that, look, by deploying that much effort, sending our soldiers to be killed there, I obtained this and that in the Syrian crisis, so this is what I bring home. So the, ultimately, it is the national interest of the uh, foreign actors that counts. Uh, fighting ISIS is only a, a pretext to promote the national interest of each individual country. Thank you very much.